Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to see all of you here this morning. Everybody here looks bright eyed and bushy tailed. We really lost an hour of sleep last night. So good to have you here and worshiping with me this morning. It's the fourth Sunday in Lent, and uh, so we continue on our path toward Holy Week, Christ's death, and of course, his glorious resurrection. We welcome all of our members here at St. Peter's. We welcome our guests who are with us at the worship this morning. To introduce our worship service, uh, I want to say this. Uh, you know, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, in the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. And we know that God hears and answers that prayer. Jesus says, whatever you pray in my name, God will hear and God will answer. So we know that God gives us our daily bread. Our worship service for today is how do we respond to that? And how does God respond to us as we respond to that? Stay tuned as we get into our worship service today. Let's begin by singing our first hymn. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, I pray. The Lord, have mercy on me, a 
center. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. <laughs> that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. triune God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power, and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise.
bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. And Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert. And there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? But they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you. This is what the Lord commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. Please join me now as we sing the psalm of the day, perhaps the most favorite of all 150 psalms, Psalm 23, written by King David, where King David reminds us on behalf of the Lord that he is his shepherd and will provide all that he needs for his life. We sing that in his <laughs>
The epistle or letter for today is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 to 11. As the Apostle Paul discusses the offering that he is about to collect uh, from the Corinthians that he will take back to Jerusalem for the tremendous need they had back there, he reminds them that what God wants in us more than anything else is to cultivate a heart of thankfulness and a heart of generosity. One of the greatest ways we can work on our Christian faith is to try to capture the heart of our God, who is a giving God, and so that our hearts are giving and generous in return. And with that, we have God's promise. He will always supply everything that we need in this life. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result thanksgiving to God. Here it ends our epistle. Please stand out of special respect for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for our worship service today is from the fourth gospel, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. Here we have kind of a high point of Jesus' three-year ministry. He's about a year and a half, two years into it. And he feeds 5,000. And this amazing miracle, this amazing sign was done because Jesus saw the need that the people had to take care of their bodies. <clears throat> Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five particles left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
He is good. His mercy endures forever. God's word for our sermon this morning is the Old Testament lesson that was read earlier on you from Exodus 16, verses 6 to 8. My dear fellow believers in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, how do we respond when people complain to us? How do we react when people grumble about something in their life? Come on now, be honest. Maybe we don't say it, but I'm sure we often think it. Why are you grumbling and complaining? I mean, to a certain extent at least, you are responsible for your situation. And so you have nothing to gripe about. For example, if someone complains about their husband or their wife, we might think, well, who chose him or her to be your husband or your wife? Or if someone complains about their job, don't we think, well, if you don't like your job, quit your job and go out and find a different one. Thankfully, God doesn't respond to us this way when we grumble. Thankfully, God doesn't respond to our grumbling by saying, okay, you've made your bed, now you go and you lie in it. Our amazing God responds to our grumbling by assuring us he already knows all about it long before any words ever came out of our mouths. And, even more amazing, God says that he is determined to shower down blessings on us in order to conquer our grumbling. And so today I invite you to join me in seeing ourselves in our sermon thing. That we are grumbling on the way to the promised land. Two points, first off. God hears all of it. Secondly, He overwhelms us with blessings. Here in our scripture text, the children of Israel are in the desert on the way to Mount Sinai. It's hot. It's barren. There's no food. There's no water. And of all the people who lead them, they have a stutter named Moses, and a wimp named Aaron. And what do they say to Moses and Aaron? If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. But there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire ascendant to death. Yes, the grass is always greener on the other side of the isn't it? God had just opened up the Red Sea. He had just delivered those Israelites from their Egyptian slave masters. And all they can do is complain. Four times in our text we're told, the Lord has heard your grumbling. It's no accident that Moses writes this down four times. He's emphasizing that the Lord knows all about the murmuring and all the complaining that they were doing. This is a pointed preaching of God's holy law to the people. Every time they complained, God heard it. Whether they complained to their wife, to their husband, whether they complained to their children or to their siblings, whether they complain to their neighbors or to their friends in the next tent. The Lord has heard your grumbling. God heard this grumbling spoken against him, even though it was said against Moses and Aaron. Moses says in our text, Who are we? You are not complaining against us. 
but against the Lord. Every time we complain in life about someone over us, see, we're really complaining against God. That's because God is responsible for the people who are put over us in life. So if we complain against our boss, we're griping against God. And if we complain against our president or our Congress, we're complaining against God. And if we gripe against our governor or the cops, we're complaining against God. And if we gripe against our parents or our teachers or our pastor, we're complaining against God. That doesn't mean we can't criticize these people. That doesn't mean we can't comment about these people. But it does mean that we are not to complain about them out of hearts that are dissatisfied and discontented with our lot in life because it is God who has put them in place over us. This is essentially the fourth commandment, which tells us that God wants to run this world through the people and the institutions that he places over us, even though they are imperfect. Huh? And so our quarrel is always against him. Oh, man, man, that point really nails us to the wall, doesn't it? For who of us doesn't love to grumble about the people in our lives? Not only those who are over us, but those who are around us and those who are with us, too. Can be our husband or our wife. Can be our parents or our grandparents. It can be our brothers or sisters or our children. It can be our co workers and our associates. It can be our fellow members here in St. Peter's in our congregation or our friends or the people who live next door to us. Huh? You know, since everybody that we associate with life is a sinner, we can be sure there will always be something about them that we can complain about or grumble about, right? But the problem is, is that we don't look into the mirror, right? And see the greatest person that we could grumble about. And that would be ourselves. Yes, the children of Israel were on a 40-year camping trip here in, in our text, there in the desert. And that was no fun, huh? It was hot, it was dry, it was dirty, and everybody was living in everybody else's backyard. There was still no reason for them to grumble. God had just opened up the Red Sea for them. He had delivered them from Egypt. And he was taking them to the promised land, a land full of milk and honey. And he most certainly would keep his word to them. And he would get them there. And they would just be patient. No wonder four times God says in our text, I have heard your grumbling. In fact, he had heard it before anyone ever said a word of it. See, that's because the words of grumbling that we speak are not the real problem. The real problem is the grumbling that takes place in our hearts. The complaining and the murmuring that goes on inside of us. The dissatisfaction and the discontent that we feel here in our emotions. They are the real problem, for they are what cause us to say them the words of grumbling. The Bible says that our real problem is how we think, huh? and that thinking we have is loaded up with daily grumbling. Our default position in life is always to lash out and to complain whenever things come to us and happen to us we don't like. It's all the proof we really need. We truly are sinners. See, the Bible calls this the sin of coveting. Coveting is wanting that which God doesn't want us to want. We are guilty of it constantly in our daily lives. 
That's why we have two commandments. It is coveting. Number nine and number ten both say, do not covet. Discontent and dissatisfaction cling to us like wet clothes. And the words on our lips simply echo the grumbling in our hearts. We don't like the place often that God has led us to in our daily lives. But look at how God responds to our grumbling. He hears all of it, and yet, here we are. We're still alive. Isn't that amazing? That this holy God knows all of our grumbling from the inside out, even before it gets onto our lips. And yet, it doesn't destroy us. It doesn't smash us down. It doesn't say to us, you people, you're disgusting. Get out of my sight, you ingrates. <coughs> God doesn't react that way at all. In fact, he reacts just the opposite. He overwhelms us with blessings. Moses and Aaron say to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your groaning. See, instead of smacking down the Israelites, instead of punishing them as they deserved, instead of sending poisonous snakes, as God did on another occasion. God gives them blessings. God gives them manna. Every morning, for 40 years, every morning except Saturday, when it was the Sabbath day, there in the ground was manna to eat. It was a coriander seed, white bread, that sort of tasted like honey, we're told. The Jews had never seen it before. And so they said, what is it? What is it? And in Hebrew, that translates into mana, mana. It could be eaten raw. It could be cooked. It could be roasted. It was bread. Daily bread. And it kept the Israelites alive for 40 years in the desert. God overwhelmed their grumbling by giving them this tremendous blessing of manna. And even more, you know, in our meals today, you can't just have potatoes. Huh? You have to have some meat to go along with that. And so God gave them some meat to go along with that with their manna. He gave them quail. Those quail appeared in the evening. So many of them that the Israelites were able to catch them, butcher them, and they ate them. There they were, in the middle of the desert, and the Israelites ate like kings, huh? They had plenty of food to eat, and a variety of food to eat. God overwhelmed their grumbling with blessings. Just like he does for us. We grumble, and God blesses us. We complain, and food shows up. We gripe, huh? And someone channels to us what we need. It might be a, a parent, or a weekly paycheck, or a family member, or a social security deposit, or a tax refund, or some food pantry, or a stimulus check, or some other way help comes. But behind it all is the God who gives us the manna that we need. That's because our God is bound and determined. He is going to take care of us. He is going to provide for us. He is going to overwhelm us with blessings, even as we continue to grumble in our hearts against him. And notice in our scripture that God gave the Israelites just the right amount of food for each family. In the morning, for each person, they gathered an omer, about two quarts of manna for each person in the family. See, God wanted to dole out what each person needed according to their individual circumstances. Because God is always concerned about us 
as people, as a person, as individuals. He wants to give each of us individually what we need for that specific day. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day or give us today our daily bread. We say it twice. It's a good thing, yeah, to do budgeting and planning with all of our spending. But we always do so remembering that it is God who gives us what we need for each individual day of our lives. This is how God responds to our grumbling. He overwhelms us with blessings. He doesn't smash us down. He doesn't consume us. He doesn't crack, crack us upside the head, you know. Instead, he opens up the floodgates of heaven and showers down good things on us. And he does all of this not because we deserve it. Not because we've worked so hard. Not because we're so great at investments and managing our money. Not because we're such fine citizens here in America. Not because we're such good Christians. But because He is a good God. That is shown us by the fact that God gives daily bread to all people. Whether they believe in him or not. Martin Luther says in the Catechism, God gives daily bread, indeed without our prayer, even to all the wicked. Huh? Or as Jesus himself said on one occasion, God makes his rain fall on the just and on the unjust. So let us never think that somehow we can pull God's strings and get what we want and get what we need because of our own goodness, our own works, our own prayers, huh? and our own attempts to impress God how righteous we are. No, no. The reason that God responds to our grumbling by overwhelming us with blessings is because he wants to humble us. He wants to get our attention. He wants to lead us to confess our sins. He wants to drive us into his arms and draw us with his love. In a word, he wants us to repent. The Bible says, Don't you know, o man of God, that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God overwhelms us with blessings because he's trying to get us to repent, to make us sorry for our sins. He's trying to get us to give up on ourselves so that we look alone to him as the source of all power in life. Oh, this sinful, evil, perverted world around us always bask in all the blessings of God without looking up and seeing the reason for all these blessings of God. And that reason is that we truly love Him for simply being our God who first loved us. God blesses us with things so that we disconnect from those things and connect to the God who gives them to us. And there's only one way to connect with this God, and that is by trusting and loving the Lord Jesus. The whole reason for God to overwhelm us, overwhelm us with, with physical blessings is to get us closer to Jesus Christ. Money, daily bread, all of the blessings of this life, see they are just tools in the hands of God to pour the love of Jesus into our hearts. And so our God gives us blessings, and sometimes our God withholds blessings from us for one purpose alone, and that is to plant faith in Jesus into our hearts. And as much as our God wants to feed our bodies, much, much more importantly, he wants to feed our souls. That's why Jesus said after the great miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, I am the bread of life. Huh? Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, 
and whoever believes in me will never thirst. This is why we begin most of our meals with that traditional table prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. For only Jesus can truly bless the food we eat and everything else that we have for this life. His forgiveness, His grace, His love, His presence, they are needed much more than any manna on our plates. Look how God responds to our sermon theme for today. Grumbling on the way to the promised land, right? He overwhelms us with blessings. And he gives us the greatest blessing of all in his Savior. Three weeks from last Friday, we will see that Savior suffer and bleed and die to bless us with a verdict, God's verdict, of forgiveness. And then three weeks from today, we will see that Savior come out of Joseph's tomb, come out of that grave to bless us with the certainty of our relationship with Him, our eternal life with Him in heaven. Uh, that's a God who overwhelms us with blessings. Amen. And the peace of God, that's beyond our human comprehension, will keep our hearts and our minds centered in Jesus, our precious Savior from sin, and the wonderful Lord of our daily lives. Please join me as we confess our Christian faith given to us by, our Holy, by the Holy Spirit. We'll use one of the great ecumenical creeds from the 4th century, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We bring forward our gifts of love for our God. Dear Triune God, we offer you this money. It comes, it represents part of our lives. We have worked, invested, and earned this money so that we can give it back to you who has given it to us in the first place. Receive it from hearts of faith and trust and love in you. Amen. May you remain seated as we pray together the prayer of the church. Gracious God and Father, we, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts 
and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and to move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Be with our country, yes Lord, be with our world as we continue to deal with the pandemic. Continue to improve all those who research concerning this virus. Bless all the medical treatments that are used, all the vaccinations that are administered. And by your power, Lord, move uh, move this world to get through this pandemic so that we can continue to praise and serve you as our wonderful God. We ask you to, we also, Lord, pray on behalf of Pastor Titus Bilo and his wife Stephanie and family as they now finish their work in Clintonville today and come among us to serve in the gospel ministry among us. Keep them safe, Lord, as they move. Help us as your people to receive them as the under shepherds of your son Jesus himself as he brings us the word of God in all of its truth, its purity, and its clarity. Lord, hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Please join me as we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Please stand, and we now proceed with the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
set aside these elements for sacramental use. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
world. That the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again. And that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace.